Now we're cooking. Welcome to another old steam power machine shop. This is number 41 video uh, and uh, we've been pressing on with the Morris engine. Uh, the last hurdle is to design and build a D slide valve which was missing. Uh, gonna, I got the cast iron block ordered up to make that. Uh, I did get the uh, casting back from Cattail for the rings and I'll show you that in uh, an upcoming video. Uh, of course, the ultimate uh, plan here is to get this engine uh, finished up and mounted on the uh, engine pad over there uh, in place of the O&S and actually run the shop with it for a while uh, to run it in and test it and tweak it out. Uh, so we're getting kind of close, but before we're getting really involved in slide valve, I had to do some things to the bottom end to finish up the job. I had to, uh, for one thing, I had to pull the engine off the base and uh, uh, drill and tap the holes for the mounting bolts. And uh, I figured the easiest way to do that is in the horizontal mill, so you can see how that was done. And then <clears throat> this cross had, uh, slide for the valve rod was way out of whack and uh, so I figured rather than trying to machine it I'd just melt all the babbit out of it and re-pour it, line it up, get it straight and then re-pour the whole thing in one shot so we did that and then uh, I had to tighten up the rod and the cross set and make a lot of small adjustments and everything and then uh, we're, we're starting on the, uh, on the valve design process uh, thanks a lot for all your comments, and uh, they were very good last time, and uh, uh, I know you model engine guys deal with this uh, slide valve issue on a regular basis, and uh, you probably can shed some light on this uh, as we go along with it. Um, so thanks again, and we'll get to work. I mentioned in the last video that I was going to make a replacement slide valve that was missing uh, but before that can be done I got to get a couple things squared away with the bottom end uh, first thing when uh, I started erecting this engine is to get get it leveled uh, this is a an old uh, precision level and I got it shimmed up under the corners here. So I got it leveled this way, the base level this way, the base level that way. The crank came out pretty darn good this way. You have to check the level of the rod. And actually, I'm trying to come up with a an absolute reference that everything has to be keyed off of. And I think it's going to be the crosshead surface here, the sliding surface that the crosshead moves up and down because it can't be changed. And uh, looking at that, it is 
it's pretty close. It's like maybe uh, a quarter of a bubble off, and that's a lot on a precision level. So we we'll straight that way. Uh, the cylinder looks good this way and this way. So with everything leveled up, then if we put other parts plumb, we know that they are straight with the part, the other parts. That's the whole idea here. So the next thing is this cross head for the uh, slide valve is babbitted. It's a sliding babbit bearing. And I melted all the babbit out of these parts. So what I'm gonna do is line this up, level it up, and figure out a way to clamp it down. And then uh, make some shims to go in here. And I'm gonna uh, make a blocking plate. It'll be like a washer with a square hole in it. It'll come up against the bottom here <clears throat> and pack it with clay and pour this in one shot. And if I have my uh, shim so that they come in right up against this corner, I should be able to get it broken apart after the pour. Okay, so with this leveled, this uh, valve shaft level. I don't know if you can see that bubble, but it's pretty close right there. The uh, slide here is right up against the housing, so it leads me to believe that this was never really very accurately put together in the first place. These holes have got a little bit of leeway in them, but not enough to get over that way. So I'm going to slot these holes so I can get this housing lined up straight with this piece here before I pour it. And then <clears throat> when I get the whole thing done, I'll drill a couple holes in here and put some pins in there. There will be a press fit in this housing and a, a slip fit into the, uh, you know, run a reamer in afterwards so that we got a slip fit on, fit on some locating pins that will hold this in line right. A lot of things to line up here at the same time. I uh, got the shims. In, made and installed. There's some fiber material, about an eighth inch thick, and the way it comes is the the point of this square hits right on the shims where it should. One. This is plumb, or I can make it so with my adjustment here. This is a fiber washer that I cut a square hole in if it's tight on the bottom that'll go up against there and I'll run a wire up on both sides and tighten it and then pack uh, Babbitt right putty around the bottom so hopefully we won't have any leaks well, this is the final setup Got it clayed up with Babbitt right, beating it up a little bit.
Okay, got the piece in the vise here. And the whole trick now is to get the two halves separated. And get the shims out of it. That'll be a big step. Still a little on the hot side. There it goes. This notch up here was a little uh, uh, three cornered wooden plug that I jammed in there to hold everything tight and straight, and that'll be a place for the oil to enter in too. You can oil it through there. Uh, as you can see that. And here's the other piece. A uh, little spot right there. Not cosmetically perfect, but perfectly serviceable. Now we just take a file and clean up all the edges and put it back together. Seventeen thirty seconds. Tap drill size for five eighths cores.
before we could start thinking about making a slide valve for up here, there were some things that had to get done on the on the bottom end of the engine. Uh, everything is tightened up and adjusted. Cross set is adjusted. Everything in the valve train <clears throat> is tightened up and adjusted. This is rebabbed and everything is lined up. The other thing is I made a pointer here so we can uh, uh, mark out the events, the exhaust, the release, uh, lead and all that stuff on the on the flywheel. So uh, first thing you got to do is find top and bottom dead center. You can't do nothing unless you know exactly where top and bottom dead center is. So I'll show you the rig that I came up with for that. And this works on any engine. Uh, I put a strap of metal across the top here with a bolt in it and the piston comes up and hits this bolt about maybe 10 degrees before top dead center. So, what I'll do then is turn it until it hits the stop solidly. And then we'll mark where it is. Turn it around the opposite way until it hits the stop. Mark that one. And then we'll find the center between those two and that will be exactly top dead center. Uh, doing bottom dead center is the same idea, it's just a little different technique. I made a pointer here, I painted the end of it white so you could see it, uh, that uh, indicates along the cross head. This cross head is kind of hard to find a place to do that, but that's going to work fine. So what you do is turn the flywheel about 10 or 15 degrees and put a mark here okay put a mark over here on the flywheel turn it all the way to bottom dead center come back up to the mark There. 
Another mark over here. Oops. Kind of blue hit my other mark. About there. <clears throat> marks. Find the middle and that'll be top center. In the uh, last video, I told you we were going to have to make a slide valve uh, because the one for this engine is missing. I don't even know what it looked like exactly. So that's kind of a challenging thing. There's, there's a lot of things involved and I'm just going to get into it enough with you so that you can see how involved this process gets. Uh, so I'm going to use something called a Bilgram diagram. Uh, Hugo Bilgram was a uh, uh, a great engineer that figured all this stuff out uh, by geometry and mathematics without the use of a computer and uh, is, is pretty amazing thing this diagram. Uh, I'll put a quick shot of it up on on the video for you. There's two ways of measuring what's going on with the different uh, events here. There's flywheel rotation which is degrees of uh, rotation of the flywheel and then there is the stroke which uh, would deal in the percentage of the stroke one way or the other in this case it's six inches and those things do not agree with each other on steam engines some engine designs are worse than others but here's the culprit right here it's called rod angularity because the rod is off to the side halfway through its stroke. So halfway through the piston stroke does not occur at 90 degrees rotation on the crankshaft because of this rod angularity. And of course the shorter the rod the more pronounced it is. That's why a lot of the really old mill engines like the Richards engine had a real long rod to minimize that rod angularity. But on a vertical engine they want to keep it kind of short so they got a lot of rod angularity 
and uh, I'll show you how that affects the valve timing and there's ways that you can compensate for that but uh, basically uh, I knew about the Bilgum diagram, I knew how it worked, I was familiar with it, but I never actually used it to design an engine with, and in this case, we're not really designing the ports and everything, we're just trying to figure out how to make a correct slide valve to go with the ports that are already there. So, uh, the missing uh, parts of the equation are different than it would be if you were designing one from scratch. Just to show you how much error there is with, when you're dealing with rod angularity, this is a scale drawing of the Morris engine uh, half size with a 6 inch crank circle and a 14 inch rod. This is the cross head top center, bottom center. So I've got it laid out here at half stroke, which you would think would be 90 degrees on the crank. It isn't. This is the error right there. And uh, if you try it at two thirds of the stroke, this line right here is two thirds of the going forward stroke. This line right here, this is the line we actually would be at due to rod angularity, and it shows you how much it's off. And if you go to three quarters of the stroke, which is the point at which I'm going to design the slide valve to cut the steam off, it's this far in error. This is actually the three quarter of the stroke line and this is actually where the crank is going to be at three quarters of the stroke. So when you're dealing with linear stuff connected to circular stuff, you have to deal with this. You have to figure out you really, all you're really caring about is where the steam events happen along this line. So you have to figure out where it would actually be in the circle. Now I've already measured these ports, uh, the distance between them and the width uh, for the layout. And just briefly, again, to tell you about uh, how a slide valve works is it's if you, in fact, if you go back in some of my older videos, like number, uh, I think it was three and a half, uh, where I explained uh, a little bit about that on the O&S engine, uh, you have a block of cast iron that's moving back and forth in here, and you have two intake ports, and these are two steam ports. They go to both ends of the cylinder. So everything that goes into this end of the cylinder and comes out of this end of the cylinder goes through this port here. The top end of the cylinder is fed and exhausted by this one. And you have a, a little sliding gate here. So of course you've got steam in this uh, steam chest. So when that sliding gate opens up, it lets steam into this port and drives the piston down. And then the uh, uh, the timing of the eccentric down here uh, pushes this rod back up and at the right time it slides out of the way and lets the steam go into this port. Well, when the steam is going into this port, this port has to be exhausted and vice versa. The exhaust port is in the middle here and it just comes out this pipe hole here. So not only is the front side of the slide valve controlling the input of steam, the back side of the slide valve is hollowed out and that's controlling the exhaust. In other words, when this port is communicated to the center, it's exhausting the steam from the bottom end of the cylinder out the exhaust port and out the pipe. And then when it uh, travels the other way, when the piston is at the other end of the stroke, it communicates this port to this opening and they exhaust the top part. That's very basically how it works. Well, the problem is how, you know, how do you see the back side to know where the overlap and the uh, cavity there that works as a valve, how do, you, how do you see that in relation to the ports very well? 
This pilgrim diagram uh, will allow you to, to determine that by geometry, but plan B for me here is to build some kind of a slide valve that I can adjust and play around with until I get the exhaust ports to line up and, and operate as they should. So I'm going to use a plexiglass plate for a dummy slide valve and this will go in there with the nuts on both sides and slide up and down. Well, it's real easy to see the intake edge but the back edge for the exhaust being this isn't really clear plastic it's smoked because that's what I had but you can when I get it in there you can see the ports behind it so if I put a piece of masking tape on one side I can lay off where the openings are supposed to be behind the valve and I can double check the Bilgram calculations that way so that's in a nutshell, that's what we're going to try to do. Okay, so here's the dummy plexiglass valve set up in here. This line scribed on here is the actual center of the valve, and I've got to scribe a line over here, which is the actual center of the ports. That's I got to take it back out and, and do that. But this is just to set it up. You can see how it works. Now I made it way too long because I knew I'd have to cut it, cut it back. So it's not even making full port opening. <laughs> 